Okay, great. Good evening. I'd like to uh, invite everyone to please take your seats, and we're going to get the meeting started. I'm Chris Bricado from the Office of Strategic Planning. And as always, we start with a few housekeeping tips. Uh, hopefully all our, all our committee members here this evening have signed in on the sign-in sheets over here. Please make sure you do sign in this evening. Uh, and you're all being seated at the same tables that you were seated at last meeting if you were here. So the, uh, the red table, the green table, and the blue table. Um, our emergency exits, should, should that uh, circumstance arise, will be out to the parking lot to our left here. Um, again, in case the fire alarm should sound, we'll walk to that emergency exit. We'll take our sign-in sheets with us and we'll convene out in the parking lot to make sure that we have everyone. Restrooms are out the hall to the left and around the corner. Please don't proceed into any other areas of the school building other than the restrooms. Um, we are on uh, MS Teams live stream event tonight. So uh, uh, as a reminder, we do have our cameras operating and our microphones operating. If any committee members would like to speak, please raise your hand to be recognized and uh, Matt or James will direct you to your nearest microphone uh, to speak so that it's very important that we all hear one another and that our audience at home can, uh, can hear you. So when we speak, please uh, raise your hand to use the microphone. Um, a reminder of our, uh, our COVID uh, circumstances that are in effect. Tonight's attendance at this meeting is limited to just committee members and staff. Our uh, public observers are always welcome to join us via the MS Teams live link which is available directly on the BCPS webpage. Um, all our online resources are there as well with that link. All, all materials from all meetings are documented there along with video archives of all our previous meetings. <clears throat> we are uh, not serving any food here this evening. There are water bottles, individual water bottles at each of your tables. Um, all Persons will remain masked while they are inside. If you need to take a mask break, you're certainly welcome to step outside for a moment. Um, we'll try to maintain physical distancing of six feet at all times. There will be some small group committee exercises where we may compromise that a little bit, but those will be kept to short 10 minute durations. Um, all resources are, are uh, individualized for you this evening, all your packets, so that there's no need to share those. Hand sanitizer is available at all tables. And finally, if anyone should find yourselves over the next several weeks um, in, uh, in receipt of a positive COVID test or in the near proximity of anyone who has had a, po a positive COVID test, please report to Mike Godfredson in our Office of Strategic Planning. He'll be your direct contact for reporting that. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to James Cooper with uh, our Cropper GIS team to uh, get our meeting started. Welcome everyone, thank you very much for joining us. Good evening all, thank you for making out here tonight. Uh, we wanna thank you for taking the time away from your families to come meet again for this very important boundary study process. Uh, Mr. Picardo uh, covered the COVID-19 mitigation strategies. Just try to stay mindful of keeping our space between each other, keep our mask on and um, and follow the procedures if you are exposed at any given moment. So the itinerary for tonight, um, we have a lot of information we have to cover. Uh, we'll start off with some new information. Uh, everybody should have packets at their stations um, this, where that contains a lot of new information, including the draft baseline options that we hope to present to you tonight. Um, please take your packet uh, and put it into the binder that you received at the initial meeting um, last week, uh, as this information is important uh, moving forward. Um, so our goal here is to review that new information, um, cover the statistics for the, for the baseline options, draft options that we have presented tonight. Um, we'll have you guys collaborate within your three small working groups as your station um, to give your initial feedback and your thoughts on these draft options. Uh, we'll share each group's uh, initial thoughts and feedbacks on these options as a whole. Uh, and then we'll adjourn to, to, to follow the next steps moving forward. So again, the, the, the main goal tonight is to review, review the enrollment statistics 
Uh, you want to compare and contrast what the current enrollment statistics look like versus the draft option. You want to uh, focus in on the maps and see exactly what areas are being impacted and how you feel about them. Um, we want to gather your initial feedback, what's your gut reaction on these options and areas that are being presented to you tonight. Uh, what are some of the advantages and limitations that you see present in front of you? So just to give a little outline on uh, the process here and where we're at, uh, it, this is meeting two um, in this boundary study process. And um, our main goal here is to, to review these draft options and eventually gain some feedback on how we can alter and, and, and manipulate these options to better adhere to the realignment criteria. Um, our main goal is to kind of work through these options over the next two meetings in order to, to get down to about one or two revised options that we will share with the public at the public at the next public information session here on November the 1st of 2021. So a little bit of um, uh, background about the Northeast area and why we're here. Uh, BCPS is in the midst of uh, a billion dollar capital plan uh, to add capacity support to, uh, to support the increasing enrollment in the area. Um, this particular uh, boundary study that we're doing is including two of those elementary school projects that are going on within the plan. Um, this uh, boundary study was approved in the spring of 2029, uh, 2021, excuse me, by the superintendent. And it includes eight schools within the study area. So what drove us to, to have this boundary study process that we're here, that we're uh, presented with today? Um, in that capital plan is the construction of a new elementary school that's gonna be located off the intersection of Roswell, uh, Roswell Boulevard and Gum Spring Road. Uh, this new elementary school is expected to open uh, for in 2022 and 2023 school year. And the capacity that this new elementary school is going to accommodate is 709 students. Um, an, a, another part of the plan was uh, the reconstruction and expansion of Red House Run Elementary School. This school is expected to open in 2023 24 school year and it will have a capacity increase from currently at 460 students to 775. So with the new construction of these two schools we're adding an additional uh, almost 1400 seats to help to help uh, uh, relief uh, over utilization that the schools presently in the area are experiencing. Uh, seven of the eight uh, participating elementary schools in a boundary study were over capacity as of uh, September 30th of 2019. So there's a great need for all schools in this, uh, in this Northeast study area to, to have these new construction schools to help relieve them. So you'll see here the two project schools at a new Northeast elementary school and Red House Run elementary school that's being reconstructed and expanded. And then the participating schools that are currently in the area are Elmwood, Fullerton, Joppa View, McCormick, Perry Hall, Shady Spring, and Vincent Farms Elementary School. And you'll see there the new, the new Northeast Middle School will be open kind of in the central part of this Northeast area along the edges of Fullerton, Elmwood, and Shady Spring Elementary School. So a little bit of background history on the Northeast area. Um, there were two boundary study processes that were conducted in 2017 that were in coordination with the current uh, capital plan that's the, and boundary study process that we're doing today. Um, this included Honeygo Elementary, which was a new school built, and the, the reconstruction and expansion of Victory Villa Elementary School. And both of those schools welcomed new students in the fall of 2018. So you'll see here that uh, there, there were many schools in the Northeast area that were involved in those uh, previous 2017 uh, boundary study processes. Um, but the four that we kind of want to be cognizant of is Joppa View Elementary School, Perry Hall, Shady Spring Elementary School, and Vincent Farms, as these schools were also involved in that 2017 process. So 
So the boundary study objective, what's our main, what's our main reasoning why we're here, what we're trying to do? This, uh, this community-based community uh, boundary study is tasked with meeting the following key objectives. Uh, that is to reduce overcrowding in the region, as stated before. Uh, majority of the schools are at or over capacity. Uh, we want to create viable and successful boundaries to effectively utilize the added capacity at the new Northeast Elementary School and Red House Run Elementary School. With the new school being built, that new school now needs a new attendance zone. Therefore, all the schools that are within that general area of the new school, their attendance boundaries therefore will be affected. Um, as, as well as Red House Run expanding its capacity, um, therefore they can also as well ex expand their attendance zone to help provide relief to neighboring schools. We also want to support diversity among the schools that reflect the community and the school system. Um, we want to try our best to have these schools mimic the demographic makeup that the county uh, currently holds. So with the, with the boundary study considerations, there's rules 1280. Here are the primary considerations. They are efficient use of capacity in affected schools. We want to balance all schools to make sure that they're used effectively and efficiently. And then we want to maintain or increase the diversity among the schools. Um, as, as stated before, we want these schools to reflect the demographic makeup that the county holds uh, among all students. Some secondary considerations that we need to be mindful of as we look at options and work through potential realignment, um, a realignment of, of attendance areas. That is maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods. We want to keep kids, uh, neighboring kids and, and kids uh, at home that they play with. We want them to all attend the same school. We want to impact uh, the pedestrian and, and transportation patterns on students. Um, we want to try to keep as many school uh, kids in walk zones as possible, while also creating zones that are uh, beneficial to the transportation, getting school uh, kids to and from school. We also want to minimize the, uh, the number of times that indiv individual students are reassigned. We're very mindful that uh, some boundary study processes have been uh, implemented in the last uh, five years. So we, we are mindful of the schools where those boundary studies, uh, previous boundary study processes affected, and we want, to, we want to be cognizant of potential families they may be impacted again and try to minimize that as best as possible. We want to look at long-term enrollment, capacity trends, and future capital plans. Uh, we understand that th this district um, has a lot of development that goes on, so we want to, when we're creating new realignment and attendance boundaries for these schools, we want to be cognizant to make sure that we provide enough relief to these schools while also giving room for potential future growth. We want to be cognizant of the feeder pattern, so where kids go from elementary school to middle school. We, in a perfect world, we would want 100% of elementary school uh, attending students to all go to the same middle school. Um, there are instances and cases where um, a school may be split, an um, elementary school may feed into uh, two or three middle schools. If that were the case, we want those, uh, those splits to be balanced 50-50 if at all possible. And the last one here is phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools. In this particular boundary study, we're only dealing with the elementary school grade level, so that particular consideration is uh, not as of high importance in this particular study. Some additional considerations. We want to try to use geographic features such as railroads, creeks, major highways, major roads. Uh, these are good boundary um, boundary lines that we try to follow when it comes to realigning students. Uh, we don't want students to have to go across major roads, if at all possible, um, to kind of keep our students and our kids safe within the district. We want to try to eliminate existing satellite boundaries. Um, as you'll see here on the snippet here, um, currently Elmwood Elementary School and McCormick both have satellite boundaries. Uh, these are areas that are district to a school that aren't uh, continuous to the main uh, home zone. So we want to, and in and, and doing so, that helps uh, get neighborhoods back together, get communities back together, and have everybody feeding into the same school. So we had a couple uh, questions that were submitted um, that was asked during meeting one. Um, so I'm going to cover a few of those questions here to try to answer, um, answer them as best as possible. 
So one of the questions uh, was request for information. You have, uh, all committee members have a packet that's in front of you. Uh, I see a few of you have already went through them. Um, please take that packet, examine it, and, and put it into your binder for, for current and future references. Um, but you'll find that there's a map with the plan and approved residential development and number of students. Uh, there's also, also information on anticipated student yield. So when a new development comes into place, what do we anticipate how many students may come from that development? Um, I think that's very valuable information to help inform us uh, when we're considering moving a certain uh, area to a particular school. Um, there's also information on projections and utilization uh, based on the 2019 official enrollment. Um, so you have a little bit of information on what we anticipate uh, a certain school currently um, to have uh, enrollment in the future based on past trends. Uh, there's also information on Title I status and programs for the 2021 school year. Um, that is determined on an annual basis and, and can change, so that is something you want to uh, research and look at and, and something that may change on a yearly basis. And then there's also a map of uh, neighborhoods impacted by the boundary study processes that went into effect in 2018. As mentioned before, we had two boundary study processes occur in 2017. Um, and there's a map that, that you'll find in your packet um, that has uh, dark purple areas that show what areas were actually affected in those boundary study processes. You'll, you'll see that no, none of those areas fall within the study uh, area that we're currently working with now, but there are uh, uh, plenty of areas that are on the boundary of the study area. So it's good to be mindful of where those areas impacted and, and, and what neighborhoods uh, those previous movements uh, affected. Uh, another question from a committee member was, what is the history of the Elmwood and McCormick Elementary School satellite areas? Um, the Elm Elmwood Boundary Satellite Area was approved in 1971. Uh, the McCormick Boundary Satellite Area was approved in 1982. At that time, it was common practice that if a new development was expected to overcrowd the home district, district school, that that new development uh, would be redistricted, redistricted to, a, uh, to a nearby school to accommodate that, that had available capacity. So at that time, that was the best practice in order to prevent schools from being overpopulated. But as stated before in our secondary considerations and additional considerations, that is something that we're trying to overturn and, and get back to continuous zones that will help get neighborhoods back together and also help with the efficiency of transportation for each, every school involved. Uh, another question from a committee member was, what is the state rated capacity, SRC, and how is it determined? Um, that's a common term that you'll see in pretty much all the tables uh, uh, that, that you'll be presented tonight and moving forward. Uh, the state rated capacity is defined by the Maryland State Department of Education. Uh, it's calculated based on the number of classrooms in the school and how they are used. Uh, there are room size and, 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 and use standards for what may or may, na may, or may not count towards state rated capacity. Um, and the capacity of every given school only includes the brick and mortar, the permanent building of the school. It does not include additionals or temporary units that may be on that site. Um, so it's, be, it's good to be mindful and be uh, understanding of what SRC and state rated capacity means and, and how that number is affected and determined. Uh, another committee member asks, uh, under what conditions may a student choose to stay in their school once a boundary uh, change goes into effect. Um, so uh, a, a student may stay into an existing school. They would need a special permission transfer um, that will be approved during the first year of the boundary change. Uh, and this is only for students currently enrolled in grades four, five, seven, eight, or 11, 12 that are affected by the change area. Um, and this is only if that student expresses their interest to remain in their current school. So you do need to apply, it needs to be in the first year of a boundary change going into effect, and then also that student must fall into one of the grades listed here. Um, if a student uh, who meets the criteria above has a sibling that's currently enrolled in, in, a, in a, uh, one of the affected schools as well, that sibling will also be given the option of remaining in the affected school. 
uh, through his or her terminal grave. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Matt. He's gonna give a little bit of review on the planning block exercises and, um, and the, the other exercises and then dive into baseline options. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. And uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some, of, uh, some of the materials. I wanna go give you an overview of some of the statistics and data so that you know what we're looking at and how to interpret some of the statistics. And then we're gonna get you guys into some groups. One quick thing. The last meeting, we did do a planning block exercise. You guys had noted planning blocks that were of question or things to look at that may be able to be split and things like that. We have those noted, but we didn't make those cuts yet. What we want to do is we, we keep the, we're going to keep those noted. After tonight, and when you guys look at the options and start to dive into them, if you feel like those blocks still need to be split or any others need to be split, note them and give us that information, and we will make sure that we incorporate that into our materials for the next committee meeting in two weeks. So, uh, so the planning blocks haven't been modified since last week, but we've got your edits or your comments noted, and then any other ones in addition to that will accompany some changes that come for the, at the next committee meeting. Another thing, we had our opportunities analysis summary. Uh, this is something that you guys all got together in small groups and uh, identified the strengths, limitations, opportunities, and challenges as it relates to this boundary st uh, study process. And a lot of really good feedback uh, as it relates to the different strengths and limitations. Uh, what we found was a lot of different groups had similar strengths and limitations and opportunities and challenges. And it really told me that you guys are thinking on the same page and have a lot of different co common thoughts about, about these factors as it relates to the different, uh, different elements that we discussed at the last committee meeting. We do have this also in your packet, and you can go, always refer back to this if you want to look at it. But it was a good exercise to give us some good information uh, and sort of help set a best baseline for some of these components of our study. Uh, consideration for educational programs. So additional seats in this region provide an opportunity to expand the availability of early childhood and special education programs. So the calculations for all options will use adjusted state rated capacities and enrollment to accommodate for these programs. And so really what we're trying to do is not uh, load, load a school with students so that then that compromises the program that's offered there and make sure there's enough space in that school to draw students in from out of zone for a program that may exist in that building. Elmwood Elementary has available capacity for enrollment above designated, designated programs is 418. Um, and then the new Northeast Ele Area Elementary School has available capacity for enrollment above designated programs is 659. So we, we're, we've adjusted the capacity to set aside space for those programs so that we don't inadvertently over, uh, fill it up too high so there's no space for the, for the program to, to, to serve kids in those schools. You can see here in your packet, you'll see information. James talked about state rated capacity and how it's calculated but you could see the state rated capacity and then the adjusted state rated capacity. So you could see like we talked about how, we re, uh, how the capacity is reduced, adjusted to account for the programs at the schools that I mentioned. Um, and, and so there's, you, you have that. So this is basically when you see this, these are the, these are the capacities of the schools. How many students are we looking at that, that each building can hold as we work through our process? You'll see some tables here that give you information about enrollment. Again, we're looking at 2019-20 enrollment right now. 2020 is a bad year to, to focus on because of the, the, just because of 2020 and we all know what, uh, how that went. But um, 2019 is a more stable year, so it's a better, better basis for planning. Uh, you see we have the pre-K through five FTE enrollment here. And then we also have the uh, over and under, so how many seats does it have excess or how many seats is it over capacity? So if you see a minus 54, like McCormick, that shows that it has some available seats according to the capacity. And you see others that have a plus, uh, plus number shows you how many seats it is over 100%. Um, and then you have your utilization number, which is what I like to look at. Uh, in addition to all the other stuff, but 
this tells you how, how full is the building. Is it 100% full? Is it 86% full? You know, how, how full is the building as it relates to a percentage? And that's just calculated using the enrollment divided by the capacity to get you that number. Then we give you some statistics that shows how many kids live and attend in the zone, how many students live out and attend in. We have unmatched, uh, when we, when we, we, what we call geocode the students, we map out all the kids based off their home address. There's always a few kids that we cannot address match. Maybe it's a bad address or maybe a PO box, something like that. That's, that's where they fall in the unmatched category. But we add them back into our enrollment totals so that we don't miss kids and that we accounting for every student that's on our list. We do have pre-K uh, numbers here so we can see how many, how many preschool children are at uh, in the buildings. And there's a difference between total headcount and FTE pre-K. And that's just basically because pre-K has an AM and PM component. So total health headcount would be 40, say 40 pre-K students, but an FTE may be 20 because you may have 20 in the morning and 20 in the afternoon. And that's kind of how we look at uh, FTE and, and pre how, how pre-K is handled. So when we estimate enrollment, when we're looking at this, we're, looking at, we're only looking at moving students that live and attend in the zones um, that in, in each of these planning blocks. And then, when we, and then we count for students who are living out and attending in a school for a program, we add those back into our numbers. So that way we're not, we're not uh, going to overload a school with kids who live in there and, 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 and compromise the, the programmatic nature of a, of a school, drawing students from out of zone. But this is a, some good information just for reference. You'll probably go back and look at this on, on occasion. Uh, I want to remind you that we have three draft options tonight. So these options are by no means perfect, and they are not set in stone. Everything that you see that's on paper, consider it written in pencil. Anything is subject to change. That's the whole, the beauty of this process is we're uh, enabling transparency and bringing these maps in front of community-based groups like you to give us feedback at the very beginning. So we want you to look at these maps with the understanding that they are draft and your feedback and your comments and your input on these maps will drive changes. We may throw a map out. We may take one map and modify it and make two good ones out of it. We may take a hybrid and combine, if you like these zones on this map and you like these zones on this map, we can always merge two together. So um, just remember that everything is draft and we're is subject to change and uh, the maps, we do expect them to be new maps to be created. Focus isn't to pick the best one right now, but really to try to build a set of options that we could take to the public in November, like James said. We've got the maps in different formats. You have the eight and a half by 11 maps in your packets. You'll see we also have large wall maps for each group. Uh, for each group has a set of maps. We got the current, and then, el and then elementary option A, B, and C, and there's, uh, for each group has a set. We also have an interactive map that you could use. Um, I love to use it. You can use it on your phone or laptops and things like that, and that's uh, croppermap.com slash bcpsne2021. That'll let you pull up the map. You can toggle on the different options, zoom in, and do a lot of things with the map. It's a good interactive way to look at the map in detail and look down at the, the address level. We have all the materials located on the web page. So all the materials that we're sharing with you tonight are available for any member of the public who wants to download and print and review those. Those are all up online right now. So if you lose your materials too or you need to share some with your neighbor, to, uh, take them to the web page. Tell them to go to the BCPS web page and they can download all the materials you guys have in front of you. I always say that when you look at these maps, it's a lot of information. You know, we're used to doing this. We got uh, 15, 20 years experience in looking at maps on a daily basis and statistics. We take for granted sometimes how overwhelming it can be with all this information, looking at all these layers and data. So I always just say it's best if you're looking for some guidance to look at the maps, study the geography, see how the maps are shaped. Then take a look at the, all the statistics and tables, see how those are looking and then start to relate them together. Look at, okay, you see a number that you don't like, well then why is it, and then look at the map. Why may it be like that? And how can we maybe make a change to a map, move a planning block to make that number look better? 
Or if you don't like the way the map looks, say, okay, what do the numbers look like on the map? Let's see, if we move this, if we move something to make the map look better, how's it going to affect the numbers? So you kind of have to look at them two and two, uh, hand in hand, and uh, always focus on developing maps with those considerations and rules in, 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 uh, in mind. That's really the most important factor as we, as we work to develop options. So we got our tables. These are when we get into the numbers for the estimated enrollment for the tables. So um, another thing to note here at this point is we are focused on developing a plan. This committee is focused on developing a plan for the final uh, phase of this. Once Red House Run is in place, the new Northeast Area Elementary School is in place, these are what the maps, these are what the recommendations should be based off of your work. Um, there is a phasing process in here where there's the new school is going to be built a year before Red House Run will be expanded. So um, just keep them, just know that as you focus on the end game, there will be an, a phasing uh, process that, that phases these zones in to the final recommendation that you guys come up with. And we will do it in a way that's efficient. We're going to try to move as many students as we can to give the relief as quick as possible, but we're not going to overload any schools in that phasing process and we're not gonna move any students more than one time. So if a student has to move, they'll either move in the first phase or the second phase, but uh, we're not gonna, they're not gonna move in the first phase and then move to another school in the second phase. We're gonna keep it efficient and uh, effective. So looking at enrollment, you can see we just basically, this shows you the total numbers of students at each, uh, estimated in each building. Uh, so if, you, if somebody says, how many kids are at Elmwood in option A, B, and C. Well, you can come over here and this tells you how many kids you have in A, B, and C versus current. And so this basically answers how many kids are in the building per our estimates. This format says really the same thing, but it just shows you how full the buildings are. So someone says, what's the utilization of the buildings in A, B, and C? Well, you can go here and look at the utilization and see how they compare to current. And you can see in the options, you know, you have a lot of schools in the 100 percentile range, but in every option, we're really, we're balancing the utilization. You know, there's Elmwood's right at 100 in a couple of these, and some are, like, you're running real close to, close to 100 percent utilization that's uh, in, in the area, so you'll see really close to those numbers, but there is balance of utilization that's created in the options to try to get rid of these 129 percent and 123 percent, so the high numbers and the imbalance that exists in some of the current school enrollment and utilization. We also have demographic data to look at and see how, how the options may impact that. Percent minority for the current schools and each particular option. We also have percent free and reduced lunch and then percent English language, lear language learners. So that gives you an idea the different demographic components of the school and how the current school is and how it may be impacted in any particular option. Something, to, things to consider. We, we track how many kids are impacted in any particular option. So this tells you how many students are impacted. So right now, option A is impacting 1,095 students. Uh, it's the, the lowest amount. And the other two are impacting around 1,200. Option C is impacted almost 1,300 students. This tables right over here are basically uh, tell you where the kids are going. And the tan, the tan colored cells all roll up to this number right here. So if they want to ask you how many kids are going to, uh, to, Red, House, to uh, Red House Run from Elmwood, you could say 202 students in option A are moving from El Elmwood to Red House Run. And then the green cells are students that don't move. The green cells are students that are not impacted. So you can kind of see how it breaks down, where kids are moving and how many kids are moving in any particular option. Feeder pattern tables, we, like James said, we're really focusing on elementary. We are not here to look at uh, recommending changes for middle or high schools, but we do report on the feeder pattern efficiency and see how, how the feeder patterns are affected. You can see we have the current zones, Elmwood to Gold, for example, Elmwood splits to Golden Ring, 40%, and Parkville Middle, 60% currently. And then in the option, Elmwood feeds into Parkville 100%. And so this is kind of when you see it listed twice here, 
Northeast Area Elementary School is split to three middle schools in option A. And so that kind of kind of gives you an idea on how the splits are, are for elementary to middle in the, in the feeder pattern tables. We also have walk zone data, so we're calculating how many kids are in the walk zones. And we do have current walk zones 794. In every option, there's, we take, there are uh, 34 students that are actually taken out of a walk zone, and that's an area that we move from Fullerton to Elmwood. It's something that we don't have heartburn with. It's something we would like to resolve and try to get all these walkers back to a walkable, walkable situation, if at all possible. And we'll ask you guys to take a look at that, see if you have any ideas or thoughts, ways to get the 34 kids back in Fullerton. And then, you know, but as you move those kids back in Fullerton, you saw how close we were on utilization. They're all running in the 90s. You can't just put them back in Fullerton unless you're okay with Fullerton being over 100%. So you may have to move some kids out of Fullerton somewhere or maybe make a couple of shifts. But we'll help you with that. Just want to get your input on, on it. But walk, walk, walk zone data is something that we're studying and making sure we're on top of. Going to go into the options, just quick overview of the options. And I really want to give you guys time to look at these maps and give you some time to really break down uh, break down the maps and look at them and get to understand them. This is option A. So with, when you do, we have these option maps, you'll see the background color is the option, and then this bold black outline shows you the current zone. So this is the Fullerton zone right here, comes all the way around, and then, and then the, but this is the new Fullerton zone, and then the new North East Area Elementary is this tan color, and this kind of comes in and pulls students from all the schools around the new Northeast Ele Area Elementary. Um, and so when you look at it, you can see that we had these satellite areas in the bottom. These areas were, uh, have been resolved. There are no satellite areas that exist in any maps now. And you can see this one, uh, the satellite areas are feeding into Red House Run mostly. And then McCormick uh, picks up some of Red House Run here. Elmwood uh, loses some of the, the top corner to the northeast area. And this is that walkable area that goes to Fullerton right now that we kind of need some help with to look at. Um, that goes to McCor Elmwood. When we d drafted this originally, it's, um, it, uh, it's, it, it's on the border of two walkable areas, Elmwood and uh, Fullerton. But they can I think it's, Ken is it Kenwood is the name of the road? Kenwood Avenue. So it crosses Kenwood Avenue is is right is the borderline right here. And so these students are most likely not going to be able to walk across Kenwood to get to Elmwood. So this would be taking students out of a walkable situation. Something to look at and see if we can resolve. And you could see we brought students, pulled students out of the southern part of Perry Hall to give them the relief they need. Joppa View uh, sent some to the new school. And then Perry Hall sent some also to Joppa View to uh, balance utilization. Shady Spring, um, the northern part of Shady Spring went to the New, Nor New Northeast Area Elementary. And, uh, and they also picked up some of Red House Run in order to balance out utilization. And then the bottom part of Vincent Farm feeds in the new school. Um, so the satellites no longer exist. Um, this does impact the fewest number of students among all options. And uh, the new Northeast Area Elementary School is be within 2% of the district average for all the demographics. So the new Northeast Area is, is tracking with the, uh, the average of, of, the, of the area. But this does have the walk walkability limitation that I talked about, the walk students in the walkable area. And the new Northeast Area Elementary School is op opening real close to 100%. So that may be a little bit too much for that school. I don't know. We'll have to just see what you guys think as you look at the maps. Option B looks a little bit different. You can see that there's a little bit more of a sh uh, uh, wrap around here of, of, of Elmwood to give Fullerton relief. And then Fullerton comes up Route 1 and pulls some from P some Perry Hall and Joppa View. And the new Northeast Area School is, is uh, more centrally located within the zone here. And more of Vincent Farm feeds into the new school, new Northeast Area Elementary School. And so um, just some, mi some moder modifications off of A that, um, 
that, that differ in this, in this map. Uh, we still get rid of all of the satellite areas. Uh, and this one, the satellite areas go to McCormick instead. Uh, and this, this is a big satellite area that goes Elmwood that feeds into Red House now. Um, the capacity is pretty balanced. This impacts the fewest, second fewest number of students. Uh, we did get rid of the three-way feeder split for Vincent Farm in this one. Um, but we still have the, the limitation we've identified is that walk zone uh, component. And you guys may have other limitations that you have identified as we work through this too, and advantages. The option C, the third map, similarities, you can see got rid of the satellites, uh, but capacity relief is, uh, is balanced. Uh, we did get rid of the three-way splits. But we do have the walkability issue that I mentioned here. And this impacts the greatest number of students. We also have some things where Vincent Farm comes in pretty close to Joppa View here. And this is something that, we've, uh, that we look forward to hearing from you on some of this. I feel like it's a little close to Joppa View here. But uh, we'll get your input on this and see what you guys have to say. So as you're working in the groups, you guys are really good. Just be mindful of, of the group and be mindful of uh, allowing each group member the time but, uh, and space to, to, to provide their, their comments. Um, just be mindful of the considerations and use each as a guide uh, as you can, can work through this. And uh, just expect that there may be non-closure. I mean, nothing's going to be perfect, but we're, we have time to try to improve and try to make these better and accomplish our objectives as best as we can. So we're going to give you about uh, 30 minutes to work within your, uh, your group. And if, if you need that much time, um, you guys have markers and post-it notes. Everybody should have their own markers and post-it notes. Um, you have your large wall maps that you can look at. And so you guys can work within your groups looking at the large maps or working within the small maps. You have your reference maps over here that we didn't post on the walls that are at the tables that give you some other reference material. And we'll be around to help you if you have any questions as you go through. Um, like last time, let's have somebody, somebody will report out to the hole. And, and you can please mark up on the maps. If you see an area, we want you guys to mark on these maps. We take pictures of these, we take them with us, and we use them as notes to make changes. So please take your markers and mark on the maps. If you think an area should go someplace, circle it. Point an arrow over here, a smiley face, a sad face, whatever you want to do to let us know how you think about the maps that we can use for notes, OK? Um, so are there any, uh, are there any questions that, I, that you guys have at this point before we let you guys go into your groups? Yes, sir, if you could step up to the, uh, to the mic. Um, I understand that you said that these were we working off the, these are the, the two projects, the current two um, school projects. Are there any other projects that may be coming that are not completely, you know, done up so that you don't quite know, but you have an idea like a school getting another school, one of the schools getting extended later down the road or another school being built possibly mm -hmm. that would fall into consideration? Yes, sir. It's uh, my understanding that there are not, there are no other projects that are funded for this area that, that we are anticipating. When, when we did the other ones, we were aware of some of this, but uh, there, I don't think, is there anything that, that, that is in the near future? So there is nothing in the near future that you guys have to be mindful of that can impact your decision making. Any other questions you guys have? And then when you guys get in your groups, we'll be, we'll be uh, browsing around. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering if you've talked to transportation yet about some of the times, or like how much time does transportation leave for, from the school to take a kid home? Um, well, so the first, the answer to the first part of your question, transportation has not reviewed these maps or the options maps uh, yet. They, we do have transportation staff present to be able to help answer questions and, and give you some guidance. Um, I don't know if there are any standard times that, uh, is somebody from transportation here? 
would you be able to comment on uh, standard times for uh, transportation? Do you have like uh, goals or thresholds for transportation? From the from the school buildings, um, in this area, many of the routes, 25 to 30 minutes at the most. Um, so that, that's the general overall answer. Thank you, and and we'll also be working with transportation. Uh, they're always at these processes and they're watching. So as you guys are evaluating these maps, so is transportation. They're looking at. They're telling us things that may be pro problematic as it relates to how kids are getting how roads are traveled, how kids travel to school, and things like that. So they're on board with us and helping us to make sure that, that we're on top of that. Any other questions you guys have before we let you get into some groups, do some group work? Okay, as you go through it, then just, uh, just work through it and look at the strengths and limitations of each option and any concerns, challenges related to planning blocks. Like I said, mark up those maps. We'll go ahead and let you get into your groups and uh, and then we'll, we'll check in here pretty soon. One more reminder, there, there is a parking lot sheet on each, of your, on each of your tables. So if you have any questions that come up in the group, please record it on your parking lot sheet and we'll be sure to answer that in a future meeting.
just wanted to make a quick comment too as you guys continue to work your work uh, you can mark up areas that you don't you know that, that you want that's a question or concern even if you don't have a solution if you mark it on the map it's something that we can try to see if we can find a solution for it so whether it's on the map or in the tables just mark it up and take notes so that we can uh, make use of that
We'll give you guys about 10 more minutes, uh, 10 more minutes, and then we'll uh, regroup as a, as a whole committee.
about five, about five more minutes, guys, if you're okay with that. So just make sure you uh, uh, wrap up your thoughts and comments on, the, on all the materials, and we'll regroup here in about five minutes. Okay, um, I think we're going to go ahead. We want to give us enough time 
to uh, listen to hear what the other groups or what all the groups have said about the map so far. Um, so who wants to go first? Let's see. Do you guys want to go first? Okay. Um, if you could uh, speak in the mic so that the the viewing audience can uh, benefit. Okay. Um, the first thing that we talked about was that there's a new development going in right near the new Northeast Elementary School that's going to bring in 60 students, which if you choose option A, would put it over capacity right away. But then when you examine it a little bit closer, option A seems to affect, uh, not seems to, by the numbers, affected the least amount of students and probably impacts the least amount of splitting of neighborhoods of most of the options. There were a couple things that we saw that we marked up. Um, for example, that little purple spot near Fullerton that normally would be walkers, which we talked about. There's 38 students in there. And we found two other spots that we could kind of rotate a little bit. So 38 here, it's about 30 something, 36 here, that they could, we could give this back to Fullerton, give this back to the new Northeast area. And then there's about 31 here that could come back to Elmwood, which does kind of rotate the same number of students and keeps the neighborhoods that can walk walkable. Um, we also uh, acknowledge that there's a little bit of an area in Shady Spring Elementary um, that is also with Red House Run that splits a neighborhood. So again, we're, we were pretty concerned about splitting neighborhoods. Um, another reason we liked A was because in Joppa View Elementary School, there's about 113 or 120 students in that little bubble right um, on the corner of 43 and Honeygo Boulevard, Honey, Honeygo, that would be pulled from them in the other two options and this would leave those neighborhoods intact that also had a neighborhood issue where someone on one street and their best friend a street over would be in a different school. Um, so with the least amount of number of students impacted and possibly switching a couple things to tweak it so that walkers can still be walkers, despite the possibility of overcrowding once that new development goes in, we did think that this might be one of the better options. Thank you. Um, did you guys have any comments on B or C? Um, or anything that you, any anything that you guys thought about B or C that you want to share with the rest of the group? I mean, I, I pretty much said that our main concern was that that Joppa View and Vincent Farm red and orange color mm -hmm. is really impacting the neighborhoods and the yeah. students. Um, also, on B and C, there's a larger corridor along Bel Air Road in the yellow that's for yeah. Fullerton yeah. that goes way far north and really does um, limit that community feeling of close proximity for Fullerton. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who wants to go next? Well, how about, why don't we have you guys go next? Um, and let's make sure they have a microphone. Good evening, everyone. So my awesome sidekick, John, is going to come up. Everybody give him a drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, a few of us were at um, option, oh, social distancing, I forgot. Um, <laughs> and we kind of commented on option A, and these were some of our aha moments. Um, so we looked at the area of PB, and we actually uh, did it with the boundary lines. We said the, air, the satellite areas, we tried to take away the satellite areas and of course say no more satellite areas. So that affected, if you look on page 33 in your, in your book, it actually correlates to what I have drawn on my map here, just in case anyone, or, or is it, just in case anyone is a visual learner, okay? So we basically stated that those satellite areas would be obsolete. 
with option A. Um, and then one of my friends over in this area said that PB 134 on your map is right in the corner. Um, that's all one subdivision. And we kind of stated that that would be Northeast Elementary School. And then John brought up a great point, but he's, he's gonna come on in a second. But we have another teammate that stated that um, the area of PB619 has 64 students right there. And we stated that chunk will go to Northeast or Fullerton, but what did you say? She said it is what it is. You know, the parents have the option either way, you know? And then John brought up a great point because the Eastern Family Resource Center um, is located in this area right now that they are slated for uh, Shady Springs Elementary School. And he was concerned specifically because Good evening, everyone. So one of the things that I, I specifically noticed was that planning block 813 across options A, B, and C, uh, which include uh, includes the Eastern Family Resource Center, which is a homeless shelter, uh, currently zoned for Shady Spring Elementary. So, uh, you know, the homeless shelter uh, includes often transient students, uh, transient families that, you know, are in temporarily until they're able to find um, uh, permanent housing and get back on their feet. My wonder is if it would be a possibility for the creators of the maps to consider crafting or creating an option where the uh, PB 813 or where the Eastern Family Resource Center is um, and would stay in the Shady Springs zone. And, um, you know, Mr. Jennings, fantastic, wonderful, love him. Um, <laughs> hey. <laughs> Um, you know, we've spent time over the years establishing partnerships, um, putting things in place, and, and not that those things can't be put in place, but relationships take time, um, and, and the possibility uh, with another option of potentially um, allowing those families to stay and become maybe less transient than they already are uh, is something that I'd, I'd, we'd be interested in. Thank you very much. Uh, do you guys have in, do you guys have any other comments about B or C or anything like that, or any other comments from the group? Um, if you do, could you step? Could you speak in the mic, please? Well, um, specifically for B and C, and I think it just went along with what the previous group said, as far as that block of kids that are in that area of like PB619, which I'd be one of, that's, they'd be going instead of to like Perry Hall Elementary, they'd be going to either Northeast or Fullerton. Fullerton specifically is going towards highway traffic first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. So those kids would probably get stuck in some issues. Um, and just to piggyback off of what my wonderful teammates have already said, um, because we're specifically, my family, are located in an area that would be going to another school, we would probably want to exercise the option to stay at their current school, given the fact that my children are going into like fourth and fifth grades, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, what about this group? You guys wanna share your comments or some of the conversations that you had? Who wants to be the speaker in this? Uh, in this group. Don't all raise your hand at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. And you don't have to capture all of it, but uh, you know, just a summary of what, you've, what you guys came up with or uh, talked about. It doesn't even have to have solutions, just your, uh, your, your con conversations. actually divided and conquered. Um, a couple of us studied the maps together and then a couple of us split off, like I said. Um, but what, one of the options, we actually noticed with all three that McCormick can actually bear more weight. So we were trying to figure out how we could add more students to McCormick without adding additional capacity to one, the new Northeast Elementary School, as well as Red House, especially since Red House is not gonna be ready 
for another year after, which is what you guys discussed earlier. Something the engineer shared with us, which was really good, was the fact that while McCormick can bear more weight, it's an issue again with the whole walking students in the walkable zone. So how long would it take transportation to transport students that aren't in that walking zone? So that's the dilemma that we saw. But again, because McCormick can bear some more weight, we're trying to you know, figure out how we can do that without adding more uh, capacity or stress to any other school. We also noticed with Shady Springs, there is a option. We were looking at planning block. It was PV812. And then we were also looking at PV203 for the new Northeast Elementary School. And one of our teammates mentioned that there's a set of apartments that's actually located. Um, and so initially it wasn't included. I can't remember which exact elevation. Oh, A, walk over to A. So it wasn't initially included in A, but because those are apartments, it would make more sense to have those students actually attend the new Northeast Elementary School. But then the dilemma with that is again, with the newer school, you do have people who tend to move. So the cost of living in that specific apartment complex community might go up, you know? Um, but again, because it's transient, however long those students are in that community, they will be going to a 21st century school with, you know, newer technologies and whatnot. So that's one of the things, or a couple of the things that we talked about. Thank you. Uh, one question. So the, the option A is the one that, that doesn't put 203 in the new school, but B right. or C does. But you, but you like how B or C keeps it in the new, puts it in the new school, mm -hmm. But for A, you think that it would be better if it went fed into the new school for the reasons you stated. Okay, yes. gotcha. And then what about PB812? What did you have, uh, so what were your PB, comments about 812? So we actually talked about possibly moving PB812 to Shady Springs, but because we know Shady Springs is already at a higher capacity, mm -hmm. we were wondering how we could alleviate some of the stress from Shady Springs also. Okay. Um, and then there was another elevation that actually took some students. It, it was like a shift of some students from Joppa View to Vincent Farm. So it was like we, Vincent Farm got 50 less students in one elevation, and Joppa View actually had 50 students. It was, it was just like basically a shift to the, to the right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, sure. that was something else. And it actually cut into a neighborhood and established community as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, this is all really good constructive input. I, we, we're proud of you guys for coming up with uh, a lot of these details in, in the second meeting. Um, I know it's a lot of material for you to take in, and uh, without having you know any headway to look at all this stuff, you've done a really good job in assessing and interpreting the data and looking at the maps. And you've got time now. That we got two more weeks between now and the next meeting. So our plans are to take some of the uh, take these comments and, and, and input and uh, see if we can generate a couple of other maps to look at. And as you'll see, we'll keep these three maps on the table and then we'll create new modifications of them, sort of evolutions of the maps as we, as we continue to work. And so, uh, so then we, we can always go back to these maps and ref refer to them later. Um, does anybody have any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, let me get you a microphone here. Here you go. Get you out. Um, just a random question um, that's been stirring in my head. How do you determine the name of the school, and has the name already been determined? Okay, so that's something that we don't uh, handle. I think it's a entire of the process. You want to answer that, sir? It's a um, policy that BCCF has that involves. Here you go. Sorry. Oh, I did not that's okay. That. Don't, that's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so it's a policy that BCPS has that we have to follow, um, and the community will be able to be involved in that process. And so the answer to your second question is no, it does not have a name yet. Um, and so that information will be posted on the website um, and everyone will be able to give their suggestions and then it'll have to go to the board to be approved in order for um, the school to get named. 
Exciting times, getting a, new, getting a new school in the community. It's always an exciting time. Um, any other comments or, uh, or feedback that you guys want to provide before we let you guys go home? Okay, well, uh, our next meeting is October 13th at the same place at 6 o'clock. We're not doing next week. We've got two weeks from now to the next one. So thanks again, guys, for all your hard work, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Have a good night.